welcome, a very, very warm welcome uh, to this wonderful panel discussion we're going to have today. I'm really looking forward to this because it is most certainly of its time. We are living in the most extraordinary times. My name is Julia Streets, very, very quickly. Um, I'm a businesswoman. Uh, I run my own organisation. I'm an entrepreneur, but I'm also a professional host. Welcome in our speakers. We have two from the Refugee Council. And we have two external speakers as well to add some richness to this reality and the quality of the discussion today. So um, let's just talk about the nature of the discussion. And this is entitled A Warm Welcome, Standing with Those Fleeing Violence and Conflict. The Refugee Council, as many of you will know, are on the front line supporting refugees as they arrive into the UK. And we are delighted to welcome also two external speakers who will be giving us real insights into the lived reality of those fleeing from the Ukraine. And I wondered if, um, if Maria, I could start with you. I was talking earlier about your experiences and also your area of focus as well. I wonder if we could start with you and then I'm going to bring uh, Olka into the, the conversation as well. Share your thoughts about well, let's call it a situation update. Talk to us about what's really going on right now. Um, sure. Um, thank you, Julia, and uh, thank you for having me as part of this discussion. Uh, I think probably the right place to start is just to remind um, about quite how unimaginably horrendous the situation is in Ukraine right now. Um, the evidence that's been uncovered from towns like Bucha, um, help us to understand the extent of the atrocities that have been committed by Russian forces against civilians and that continue to be committed every single day. Um, there is no safe place in Ukraine now. Just yesterday in Lviv, which is in western Ukraine, quite near to Poland, it's considered to be one of the safest places in Ukraine and a lot of Ukrainians from elsewhere in the country have uh, been fleeing there. Um, there was a missile strike there yesterday with um, civilian casualties. Uh, so uh, I think it's just important to re remember um, and, you know, we're thinking a lot, I'm thinking a lot about the uh, Ukrainian refugees that I'm in touch with every day and the hosts and the people arriving. Um, and it's, it's very hard to even process quite how horrific the situations and bloodshed, um, you know, the, the, the everything that Ukrainian refugees have been fleeing in Ukraine. So I suppose that's really the starting point. Um, but with regards to the situation for refugees, um, it's been a very overwhelming time for the Ukrainian Institute London. Uh, we've got very low resources and we've been working really, really hard to try to respond. We're actually a cultural charity. Uh, we usually do cultural events, but given the situation and just the floods of emails we've been receiving every day, because we do have the language skills and we do have the community kind of base, um, we've you know, been doing our absolute best uh, to try to support refugees and share the right information. Um, but uh, I mean, we'll, we'll come on to this in the discussion, but of course the, the visa systems and the, the support that is in place is it's nowhere near enough and these visa systems are not fit for purpose and it's putting so much pressure on communities, uh, organizations like the Ukrainian Institute to try to respond um, in this situation. Um, but I suppose finally I would just like to say that we really are grateful for the work that's being done by the Refugee Council because we're very new to this. We are not, we haven't got any experience of supporting refugees in the past. And um, now it makes sense for us to be part of, you know, core to that, those efforts. And I'm sure Ola will tell us more later about the Ukraine hub that she has set up bringing together Ukrainian organizations across the country. And it's really, really inspiring what people have been coming together to put in place. But unlike the Refugee Council, we don't have long ex experience of the kind of support that's needed in the long term as well. And uh, this is all new for us. And there are a lot of people working around the clock to try to do everything to support, but we don't necessarily have all of the experience needed to manage, um, you know, manage all of these inquiries professionally. So it is, it's really important. I think this combination of charities like the Refugee Council with the experience and Ukrainian community organizations who understand Ukrainians and know the language and understand the experiences for Ukrainians right now, those two together are gonna to be really, really important for us moving forward. I am Ukrainian. My family is in Ukraine. And whenever I start speaking about it, my bottom lip quivers. So I'm going to have to move on. But this is extremely also personal for me. And the Ukraine Hub UK that we set up 
uh, pretty much in the first three days following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, was to ensure that there is coordination in the community sector uh, of Ukrainian community organizations and leaders across the United Kingdom. Uh, we count 64 organizations across the UK, across Ukrainian university student associations, again, across the whole of the United Kingdom. And we set up a higher uh, education institution expert task force where we not only wrote uh, policy briefs. Um, we met with individuals like Evner and, and Renee, uh, who helped us understand how to best respond as a community of experts, scholars, and students, and organizations across the United Kingdom. And we've been monitoring the situation on the ground in Ukraine and on its borders, obviously, for the last 55 plus days. Um, and, and to say that the situation is, is, is dire uh, is, is an understatement. The IOM currently estimates that we're just about to reach 5 million mark of displaced individuals because of the war outside of Ukraine, 5 million. We are not even two months into this war right at this point. In, uh, in terms of internally displaced uh, in, the, in, in Ukraine, which is 7.5 million internally displaced individuals in Ukraine, two thirds of that are children. The UNICEF estimates that 55 children are displaced every single minute of every single day of this conflict. Uh, the IOM director has said that the scale of what is happening and this forced displacement out far uh, exceeds any worst case scenario and planning for it. And this is why I think both the United Kingdom's the government's response to this um, it needs to be put into perspective, but also the incredible work that refugee uh, sector organizations such as the Refugee Council do is important here. Uh, just to put this into perspective, because I know people sometimes don't truly understand the scale of these things, according to the UNHCR data finder, it took about three years of the war in Syria to get to three million uh, externally displaced refugees. In Ukraine, this happened in the first two and a half weeks following Russia's invasion. We are now at the place where we were several years into the war in Syria when it comes to the displacement of individuals. And yet in the United Kingdom, people are waiting on weeks and weeks on end for their visas to be processed. Just to give you an update on what we have done in the United Kingdom so far, is accordingly, we've only processed, uh, well, only 16,400 uh, 16, individuals have arrived in the United Kingdom. If we're talking in, in, in terms of 5 million displaced outside of the borders of Ukraine, clearly there's something here that's going uh, awry when it comes to the Homes for Ukraine scheme and the family scheme in terms of the slowness, the complexity of the procedures, the lack of language support in these procedures. Uh, and that I think is where we are today. A lot of people working very hard on the ground, including the Ukrainian community, uh, refugee organizations. Definitely the Refugee Council has been so supportive of our community leaders, but we are certainly not living up to the scale of, of the tragedy that is unfolding in front of our eyes. We've got a real, the most unfair and ineffective refugee protection system in the UK since it was created in 1951. So the system of support that should be in place for any person seeking asylum um, or um, refugee protection in the UK is just not in place. The basics aren't there. So um, the basic safe routes to protection aren't there for Ukrainians that should be there. They're not getting access to refugee protection. It's a managed migration route. Um, and this is not the way that you respond to a crisis. And the essential services like housing and legal advice to live with safety and dignity and to rebuild their lives just aren't in place. Um, so we're seeing very piecemeal um, policy solutions being put in place that actually in effect serve to marginalise and isolate people and deny them a voice in choice in what they need to be able to stay safe and rebuild their lives and connect with their loved ones. And at worst, it endangers their lives. And that's the key, one of some of the key concerns for us. We've been partnering with local authorities, with Ukrainian-led organisations like Olhas and Maria's to be able to provide wraparound services for those people coming through the um, Homes for Ukraine system uh, scheme, sorry. Um, 
as we already do for people who've arrived in the UK from Afghanistan and elsewhere in the world. But that's just a, a tiny minority of people who are going to get uh, receive that sort, source of support. The other key area and cause for area of concern for us is because of these holes in our system that should be there to protect everybody who needs um, refugee protection. We're focusing on crisis intervention, so intervening as early as we can to ensure that every person is able to um, access um, safe um, and secure housing and financial support to make sure, regardless of their route of entry, um, to ensure that they get the, the right um, support they need when they need it. Um, and doing that in partnership with other frontline organisations, with local authorities, in particular um, refugees at home who you may have, um, have heard of and other Ukrainian-led organisations, particularly in London, where the need is, is being most keenly felt at the moment, although we're aware that there are other pockets um, of particular need as well. Al alongside of this direct service delivery response, which is absolutely essential to ensure that nobody falls into destitution um, or is harmed in any way, we've got real concerns about exploitation, particularly of single women and children. Um, through the holes in the current policy um, policies that are in place around the schemes. We're also working alongside of other frontline organisations and Ukrainian-led organisations to strengthen that local frontline capacity to make sure that we're not just responding today, but we're going to be here in the longer term for people um, and making best use of the resources that we all have and the skills and, um, and strengths that organisations have but lean in together to identify shared operational and practice issues and come up with shared solutions as well, because we believe that together um, that enable, ensures that every person seeking um, a protection is going to be able to um, access um, that support in the longer term. And also we can advocate for the policy changes that are needed to ensure that we have the right system of protection um, for every person seeking um, refuge in the UK when they need it. But you know there is a question coming your way, which is, uh, you know, it, about the government's response. You know, is it sufficient? Love to hear your thoughts on, uh, you know, what what is what what is the current government policy doing, and is it is it sufficient? Yeah, thanks, Julia, uh, and thanks so much to Maria and and Olga and for everyone that, that that's joining us. I mean, you know, I, I just don't think we can underestimate the the, the scale of of what we're facing here. Olga really well put set it out and in the first couple of weeks you know UNICEF were estimating that a child was displaced every minute you know a child became a refugee for, for every minute because of the numbers which is just extraordinary if you think about it the government was late to, to respond you know it was caught on the back foot Europe the EU waived visas and our government still hadn't brought forward a, a proper scheme a proper response the first thing it did was a pretty paltry response. It, it decided to extend visas to people who had Im Ukrainians in the UK with immediate family members. So their immediate family members could get a visa to come to the UK, emphasis it being a visa. Then they got pressure from their own Conservative MPs. So they said, okay, we'll extend it to extended family members. But these again were just family members. It took a number of days until they then came forward with this Homes for Ukraine scheme, which again was a visa scheme. And it was a visa scheme that required a Ukrainian individual to find a UK member of the public who would sponsor them. And then the form had to be put together online by them together. Now, just let's think about what that visa scheme means. You know, when any of you travel to India or to another country, you have to get a visa. You know, getting a visa is not a simple, straightforward process. You have to work out how you have to go, go, go through it. You then have to do it. If you're a Ukrainian, you know, you don't necessarily have an internet connection. You don't speak any English. Going online to do a 30, 40, 50 page visa form where you've got to upload all your documents, which you may not have with you. You may not even have birth proof of, of your children. There was an extraordinary situation of a woman that gave birth to a child in Poland having fled, she wanted to come to the UK with her newborn child. Her newborn child didn't have the documentation to prove she was a UK citizen, so she, uh, a Ukrainian citizen, so she couldn't apply for a visa. To get that documentation, she would have had to go back into Ukraine. I mean, how ridiculous is that? Into the war zone to register her newborn child, to get the documentation to apply for the visa. So as Maria has said, and as Olga said, we've got a visa system which is wholly 
unfit for purpose to respond to a humanitarian crisis. It's just not what we need. We need a mechanism which allows people to get to the UK safely as quickly as possible through a frictionless scheme. The EU waived visas, we've been calling, we, we got Oxfam, Save the Children, IRC and the big international NGOs to support us in calling for a visa waiver program or to put in place a simplified emergency humanitarian visa scheme. The government could do this at a stroke of a pen. It doesn't need primary legislation. They can change immigration. Pretty Patel could do it in the next 10 seconds if she wanted to. It's a political decision not to do that. And let's remember that if a Ukrainian now arrives in Dover, having made a dangerous journey on a boat across the channel, they will be deemed under this government's new proposals that are going to go through the Lords and the Commons in the next couple of weeks, their new borders bill, they will be deemed a criminal for having illegally entered the UK. Just pause. They have come from Ukraine with nothing, overland, they couldn't get a visa, they arrive in Dover, they have illegally entered the UK, they will be criminalised and could face up to four years in prison. That is how this government wants to differentiate between those that come through so-called so authorised routes, i.e. a visa route, or on, on for Afghanistan through a resettlement route, or those, many of whom who can't access those routes, have to come overland. They will be criminalised. And even worse, just to finish, under the scheme that was announced over Easter, this government could deem them of having gone through a so-called safe country, France, Italy, Spain, say to them, you should have stayed there, therefore we're going to rule your case what is described as inadmissible, and we're going to send you to Rwanda. We're going to transport you as though you're a form of human cargo to Rwanda, where we will dump you and you will have to negotiate the Rwandan asylum system. So that is our government's response. Very poor response in relation to humanitarian crisis, but then wanting to criminalise those Ukrainians who can't even access the visa scheme. You know, it's 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 hard not to get a little sad after hearing, um, especially the last few points Enver made, because if you can imagine people who have had, who might have themselves personally fled direct violence, rape, a, a just horrible, horrible situations, to then be placed in this. Um, in, in it, to be to be somehow a pawn in this political game is is really is really um, frightening. Uh, but I would like to tell you a little bit about who these people are first, yeah, just so that we can even further place into context who we're talking about and what then what needs to what we need to do. First of all, this is a vulnerable population. These are predominantly women with young children. There are cases of unaccompanied minor, and I know Renee and Enver have been particularly uh, working on this issue from the very first day when we met in that very first week, this was a priority area for them, um, and elderly. But the elderly uh, group is least likely, according to our research and assessment, to be able to make the journey even out of Ukraine, Ukraine let alone to the UK's borders. But I think there's something very important here in the way that we've set up some of the support mechanisms for Ukrainians. This is a vulnerable group, traumatized. Support needs to be in place for well-being and psychological trauma treatment. There needs to be help with parenting and children going through trauma. If you are a mother that has escaped violence herself, you are dealing with your own trauma, let alone helping your children through that trauma. And of course, those hosting do not have training in these things either, right? So there's a lot of burden on local communities and hosts to help in something that is really ex it needs professional assistance and government support. Um, but who are these people otherwise? Well, I think it's really important to note that they have a strong sense of civic identity and state attachment in our research. And I would like to just give you one little piece of data from Ukraine. I know that this is not a you know, data place, but I'm a researcher after all, so I'm very nerdy. We all know that the pandemic has hit support for democracy across Europe, right? We, see, we have seen levels of support for democracy drop everywhere, including in the United Kingdom. Let me give you the story about the Ukrainians that are desperately fleeing war right now. During the course of the pandemic, support for democracy has gone up by 16 points in Ukraine. 
belief that it is your absolute civic duty to engage in uh, elections went up by another 10%. Belief that it is your civic duty to engage in civil society organization and community engagement also went up by 12 points. These are the people that are coming to the United Kingdom that need our support. These are people that will not only integrate into the Ukrainian communities that already exist and into our local communities, be it in Manchester or Oxford or Coventry or <laughs> Glasgow, they are the people that will then also contribute to our communities in a way that is incredibly important for us. Um, so I think that is here. We need support for mothers, for children, education, psychological trauma support, but we also will be getting a great deal from these individuals who once they are able to have a safe place, these are the types of people who in a pandemic decided, no, we're going to double down on democracy. I mean, when I hear that data, I get shivers all the time. And as a Ukrainian, it makes me fiercely proud. But these are the people we're dealing with. I can't really pinpoint it. Help is needed everywhere. Um, but I would say one of the things that is a bit more difficult to respond to is the language question, because um, a lot of people I know actually are wanting to come to the UK because they do know a bit of English. And I'm in Germany right now because, I mean, obviously it's a lot easier for Ukrainians to reach Germany. A lot of some of my own relatives and um, my partner is Ukrainian. So some of um, his relatives are now here and friends of ours. Um, but a lot of the other people I know want to come to the UK because they do know a little bit of English, but very little. And even those people, when they do arrive, it's not enough English to be able to get by in day to day life. And Russian, even Russian in the UK, very few people speak Russian, let alone Ukrainian. And more and more Ukrainians now, are, you know, already it was a majority. Everybody in Ukraine speaks Ukrainian. But even those who were speaking Russian are more and more, especially now, deciding to speak Ukrainian. And we've also had a lot of inquiries from people wanting um, trauma counselling. But to find a Ukrainian speaking trauma counsellor in the UK is very difficult. Um, and obviously services are starting to exist. But I think tapping into the Ukrainian communities that already exist that are very strong and Ola is a great person to kind of reach out to and this site that she's created of the Ukraine hub there is a list there of all of the Ukrainian community organizations across the UK. So it's been an incredible pulling together at the front line with local authorities and local communities and that outpouring of public support but what is missing, and I think this is the piece that we get concerned about in terms of safety nets, is really the coordination and the building of the capacity for people who perhaps have never worked in this space before, providing that quite specialist support that they're now being asked to provide. I think the things that we're at risk of missing as well are, and it's, this relates to the pressures already within the system, them, is that local authorities were already under immense pressure um, in terms of supporting um, refugee, uh, sorry, UK um, citizen communities as well as newly arrived communities. They need more support um, from, uh, from, the, from um, government and clarity in terms of policies and, and procedures, but also that ability to coordinate. They know their local communities. They can draw in experts like ourselves and then working with um, Ukraine-led organisations as well to be able to provide that um, excellent wraparound support that people need. On the therapeutic point um, as well, it's absolutely essential that you have trained um, interpreters who can work alongside of trained therapists to provide that immediate um, crisis intervention support because if people get that immediate emotional support, they're often able then to move on um, and then be able to rebuild their lives. Not everybody is going to be traumatized for the long period. They're dealing with trauma and then often can then move on with their lives. Others will need longer term um, support, but that, that partnering of those two pieces is really key. I think safeguarding, I know that's been in the news a lot. It is our biggest concern. It's shared by local authorities. And so much of that is about making sure that you've got professional people who are able to provide that um, wraparound support at the, at the prior to people arriving, making sure they're arriving in a safe place and they have that ongoing support as they move through and rebuild their lives in the UK. I think the other piece is because people aren't here as refugees, they haven't got refugee protection status, they don't have automatic right to family reunion. We're talking about single mothers and their children being far away from their loved ones, their partners and their wider relatives. Absolutely, when they're thinking about their future, they're thinking about how they can reunite as a family. That is critical in being able to, for people to even think about the long term. So I think they're the sort of the three key pieces for me, coordination, 
um, expert support um, and safeguarding and family reunion. My biggest concern is, is that we don't give uh, every single Ukrainian that comes to this country the, the warm welcome, the support um, and what they fundamentally need. And, and that the system fails or you know it, it falls short in too many individual cases. So for example, we already know that people that are arriving on the family visa scheme are ending up um, not being able to stay with family members. They're having some of them even to present as homeless to local authorities. And we're having to work with other charities to try and find them a host somewhere they can go and stay and then help them access benefits because they're not entitled to any of this so-called wraparound support. Councils are not being funded to provide that to them. So imagine arriving here, being very vulnerable and ending up homeless. I mean, you know, that, that is far from good enough and that is a significant gap there. I think the other area is for those that come on the Homes for Ukraine scheme, which, you know, is a bold and ambitious scheme and actually versions of it exist in, in Poland, where I was reading today that Poles are being paid a particular amount of money for every day they host the Ukrainian. Um, what's happening with our Ukrainian scheme, the Homes for Ukrainian scheme, is that sponsors will be paid a fee, 350 pounds uh, per month. But those sponsors, and it's wonderful as Rene says, that people have been so amazing in their desire to want to host, to want to sponsor Ukrainians. I mean, in a phenomenal outpouring, which says something about Britain's desire to welcome refugees generally. But many of those people will be doing it, going into it relatively blind. And, you know, they do need support. They do need some basic training. They need to know how to meet the needs. They need to ensure that that process doesn't break down. Because imagine again, if you're Ukrainian, you, you have a sponsor, you go and live with them, two or three weeks time, it breaks down. It doesn't work out for various reasons. You're then, where, where do you go? What do you do? You know, you're facing potential homelessness. How do you navigate a complex benefit system? What happens if you haven't got the key doc piece of documentation, what is called a biometric residency permit, which allows you to open a bank account so you can apply for benefits? You know, these small things are so important and that's why sponsors need advice and help, but that's why organisations like us need to work with, with those sponsors and with Ukrainians. And if Ukrainians are sponsored far flung, you know, they could be in the outer, from the outer Hebrides to uh, Liverpool, right all the way down to the depths of Cornwall, will every local authority be commissioning services, support for, for every single Ukrainian? Again, we don't know. There will inevitably be a postcode lottery of support. So my, my fundamental point is we need to ensure consistent support and that every individual Ukrainian gets help. And that's by us working with the Department of Leveling Up the Communities uh, and local government to ensure that they get the system right, that they work with local councils and that we have good partnership working and good provision on the ground. One final thing, it's positive that actually the Department of Leveling Up and not the Home Office are doing this, because the Home Office have a terrible reputation for impoverishing people that are in the asylum system, for treating them as though they're, they're, they're pieces that are moved around a chessboard, and for failing to get their act together to house Afghans who are still languishing in limbo in hotels. So we hope that the Department of Leveling Up and Communities will work better because of its links into local government. The system that they put in place allowed, if you like, a thousand flowers to bloom on matching. So, you know, we, we've been in touch with lots of people at the Refugee Council, we've been in touch with lots of people who effectively have done their own match. They've found someone on Facebook, a Ukrainian woman with, with children, they've, they've matched them and they're gonna be sponsoring them and, and hosting them. Of course, the risk with that is, is you don't have any control, you have no oversight, and there have already been instances of, of individual men making very inappropriate comments to, to, to women through matching. And then even, you know, there have been, there've been cases of, of the matching arrangement, sponsorship arrangement breaking down because the individual Ukrainian family felt uncomfortable, the woman specifically felt uncomfortable 
about being in, in a home with a man that was making you know inappropriate comments and so forth so what the government is looking to do and we've been pushing the government to create some kind of oversight mechanism if you like some kind of system of kite mark whereby you identify the matching organizations that have been validated by government and they are in the process of doing this they're working it up they're going to recommend specific organizations that can do matching including some that we're working very closely with there's already one that they have done called reset and anyone uh, listening to this tuning into this if they want to go to a recognized matching organization go to reset and they're going to do others and they're going to create a system of, of light touch validation it's probably not good enough in terms of complete oversight but it's a start and it should hopefully address the risks that people have outlined. Very briefly on the wraparound support, that's what should be happening. You know, local authorities should be commissioning the likes of Refugee Council or either doing it themselves to provide support through individuals that are trained, expert, can identify issues around trauma, issues around crisis before they emerge. But another gap I'm afraid is that government haven't committed to additional funding to the NHS or to every clinical commissioning group. So every GP has funding to do a health check to actually sign up every individual Ukrainian or additional funding to mental health services. There is a regional element. Most displacement does tend to happen in the direct neighboring countries as is happening uh, in this case. So in terms of where it's happening, but in terms of, um, in, in terms of the numbers, fleeing violence. Uh, I think it's the type of war that is being fought. The fact that civilian uh, infrastructures, homes uh, are being targeted, in fact. Um, we know that mothers and children sheltering in a theater in Mariupol were targeted by a missile strike. So it is precisely because of that nature. And I think there will be years of investigation into the, the the actual practicalities of this war and how it looked like and how how quickly it moved in those first few weeks and how that um, resulted in the sort of displacement within Ukraine and also outside of its borders. Um, I would like to just mention that according to our research, most Ukrainians do in fact plan to return home um, and they are adamant about this. And I think when we work with them here in the United Kingdom, when we welcome them, um, when we think about their integration into our communities uh, and the support that we provide to them in this regard, we also need to be mindful that they believe very strongly that they will be returning to Ukraine to rebuild their country. In fact, according to our data, we're, we're talking about 90 something percent of the population as it's surveyed currently, including those abroad. So this is this delicate balance that I think we also need to strike when we are providing wraparound support. And I don't know if um, local, uh, uh, whether it's politicians, policymakers, or community organizers might understand that that is actually traumatizing to be told you will not be returning home, that it's unlikely to be so. So we really need to focus on your language, on English, not your Ukrainian language education for your children. Right. So I think there's it's it, that element, it makes it a very different, um, I, I don't know, it, it perhaps makes it a slightly different community that we're dealing with. and. Um, and this strikes me as something that is still not really... Um... One of the number one inquiries that I've been getting from Ukrainians um, who are in the process of uh, wait, well, waiting for these visas to finally get to the UK is worries about being able to get back to Ukraine. Because a lot of people don't have um, international biometric passports, so they've been going through this horrific experience of traveling hundreds of miles across Poland to get to a visa application center. I mean, the whole experience is just unimaginable. But then their worry is because they will only have the, you know, residence permit for the UK, as soon as they can, they want to be back in Ukraine, they, and they want to be rebuilding their country, like Ola um, has mentioned. And I've been in touch with a lot of Ukrainians now, and the story is the same from all of them. They're all following so closely everything that's happening on the ground, and they're desperate to go back. I have, um, I have several friends now who, who are back, 
and one of them just arrived in Lviv yesterday and there was the missile yesterday thinking that Lviv was now safer because the um of the focus on the east of the country but I mean it really isn't safe in the, across the whole country so I am actually that is something that I, I another very very common inquiry is about Ukrainian schools because yes people want their children to learn English but they want them to continue their Ukrainian education too and you know I think that supporting Ukrainian Saturday schools and um, you know all just being able to continue education in Ukrainian um, should be an option for people. I, I'm concerned that as I make some closing remarks that I will actually not do due credit to your to your comments so I'm going to come to each of you if you would to, to leave our audience with some closing thoughts as as you sort of uh, part us today and to the audience who have joined us um, what might your ask be Olga can I come to you first well I think we've highlighted several uh dark realities of the situation and pain points in the process uh, of matching, applying, and arriving. Um, but we've also highlighted some success stories, both on the government side, the capacity to act, perhaps not as quickly as we would have liked, but nonetheless, I think the Homes for Ukraine scheme was uh, uh, quite um, positive. But here, I think this what has been most positive in, in that we've seen over the last month and a half is this cooperation between existing organizations with loads of expertise, such as the Refugee Council, and a broad cross-sector community base, whether it's academics and experts or community organizers um, that are you know, a Women's Business League of Ukrainian Women, uh, a scouting organization, uh, many different organizations of different stripes. And it's so refreshing to work um, with specifically Enver and Renee that uh, we've been uh, speaking about this for quite some time because they have centered and sought to center Ukrainian voices. And they have made connections to wider, more representative um, groups across the United Kingdom, including Ukrainian groups. Mm -hmm. And when experts have a proven track record, but nonetheless are able to offer help and guidance to community members and do so with humility, nuance, and respect, they are not only able to figure out what's going wrong, which is so much of our conversation has been about, but think about what we more can we do. And I think this is where we are at, this cooperation uh, and this ongoing uh, work together and centering Ukrainian organizations and experts who know what they're doing. I think that's what where we are at. Mm -hmm. And Maria, can I ask you for your final thoughts as, as you as you talk out to the audience, you know, what would you ask for? Oh, you're, you're Sorry, I'm muting myself. Um, I really would encourage people to donate to the Refugee Council. I think that the, the Refugee Council really is doing crucial work. And I think, as Ola said, and as we've kind of discussed throughout the, the talk, uh, I think this synergy between Ukrainian community organizations and charities like the Refugee Council that have uh, years of experience is going to be really crucial. And we also very much hope that the government will put in place more um, systems, but I think the Refugee Council are very, very well placed to be lobbying the government for that because you guys really understand what those systems need to be in a way that I don't, for example, honestly. Um, I know that what we have now is not working, but I don't know what all of the systems that need to, what need to, that need to be in place. And so I think probably the one thing is to donate to the Refugee Council, and that's, that's also why we're here today. It's about how we invest in those organisations at the front line, not just their capacity to be able to provide that crucial frontline response in terms of one to one support, but how they also crucially work together um, and particularly around centering that response around um, the voices and needs of people from Ukraine. I think that's absolutely crucial. It's that long term investment in, in the system. And when we do that together and we're stronger together collectively, then we can raise our voices together because that's how change happens, both in terms of operational capacity, but also in terms of advocating for policy change, too. I think there's a, a remarkable uh, opportunity here, actually. I think it's incredible the generous support that's been offered by so many companies, businesses, corporates. Uh, wanting to to reach out and do their bits by the British public, not just the more than 200,000 now, I think, that have offered to host, but their friends, those in their communities. You know, I read about a whole village in, in Oxfordshire that was coming together. 
all 70 houses in a very small village. I think this is a huge opportunity to bring people who've never really engaged with refugee issues to understand what it means to be a refugee and then to advocate for the plight of refugees and to, for them to understand that this government is trying to differentiate between the ones that it sees as the acceptable, the good refugee, the ones it sees as the bad refugees coming across the channel. And for them to become advocates for the plight of refugees is a, is a great opportunity. So I call out for people to, to do that within their own networks, their communities, those they, they live with, they work with, those they know.